That movie was made when I was away overseas. That's my bedroom, and I want to know who's in my bed. Okay. But, uh, but guys, Christmas is going to be, it's always a lot of fun, but we never want to, want to take away from the sacredness of this mo- most momentous time by the sentimentality that can sometimes outweigh it. But this is a great time of year. Let me tell you why. We have been focusing on the four different gifts that God brings. When Jesus came, he came to bring with him gifts. He brings the gift of peace, the gift of joy, the gift of, of hope, and, and the gift today of this beautiful thing that we would call love. For me, this is the big one. There's nothing sentimental about what Jesus did. It was a great act of sacrifice, and the condescension of God to become a man can never fully be comprehended. And so this theme of love. Now, the sermon is about love. But I need to set you a scene for for when we come back next year. I'm already thinking ahead, and the elders and the pastors have met. And we have established a theme that we'll be talking about in church. We've entitled it this, The Norwegian Settlers Church, The Most Loving Place in Town. That's what we want. We want people to know that this place is the most loving place in town. We want them to know that they can come here and they can have all the other stuff that goes with it, But they need to know that this is a place where above all else, you will find this thing called love. We're going to turn that into something practical for next year. But for the first 40 days of next year into the second term, we're going to be running this theme. So I want to set the scene for you today and uh, give a general sort of a, a thought of what this love thing looks like. Now, Christmas is obviously a celebration of the gift of love that God has given to us. But how sad it is, is where love is given and love is not reciprocated for. And so it's this reciprocation to God's love that I want to focus on today. We all know that God loves us. We sing songs about it. Your love never fails and never gives up. We sing all the songs about how much God loves us. But I want to focus today on our response to God's love and what I think an appropriate response might look like. Now, in order for us to understand our response to God because of what He's done for us, obviously we need to love Him. This is the thing. So our love for God will look like a three-dimensional thing, and I want to show you this today. The first aspect of our love for God is simply, number one, our love for Him simply because He's God, simply because He's good and He is our God. That's the first aspect of what this love will look like. But then we realize that biblical love is not just about loving God. It's also about loving our neighbors. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And here's a tough one. The biblical injunction to is not just love God, love your neighbor, but love your enemies. And in the context of this incredible love that God has given to us, this, I believe, should be our threefold response by way of returning God's love to, to him. A few years back, I was privileged to lead a a trip to Israel. Helena and I took a team across to Israel, and we did the the tour of the Holy Land. It was a remarkable time. And uh, we spent a a, a day at the Dead Sea. We slept at a hotel on the side of the Dead Sea that night. And I remember going with a couple of the guys early, early in the morning before the sun had even come up. And we went down into the water of the Dead Sea, and we paddled our way out to a long way out. Now, you can't sink, so you're going to drown. There's no great whites there. There's nothing that lives in that thing. And we sit in the water. That's what you do. And you, we pushed ourselves out and paddled ourselves out right almost, it seemed, to be in the middle of the Dead Sea. And it was dead quiet. No ripples, no nothing. And I had an opportunity to sit there being held up mysteriously by this unique water And my mind began to reflect as I looked around from sitting out there at all the things. You had the Golan Heights on the one side, and you have your mind, and the picture goes to the wars that have been fought on there. You look up, and you can see almost in the distance Masada. You can see so many of these other amazing places where great battles were fought. And David ran through those mountains, and Saul chased him. And uh, we were close to, to so many of those amazing, particularly Old Testament sites. And you begin to reminisce and you begin to think about, man, imagine that. And you, your, your imagination goes crazy. So I thought about, about this Christmas time. And I thought, you know, we sit in an ocean of love. 
just like I said in the ocean of the Dead Sea. You can't sink into this. It's so vast and so wide and so deep, but you will not sink into the depths of the amazingness of who God is and His love for us. And at this Christmas time, I would suggest that each one of us begin to revel, to begin to revel in the atmosphere of what Christmas brings. The atmosphere of the ocean of love that we speak about, we hear about it, we sing about it. We sit in the ocean of this love, in this ocean of apparent goodwill between men that the angels spoke about. And in the midst of the ocean of that love and that goodwill, I would recommend that you take time this Christmas time to do what I did in the Dead Sea, to sit quietly, reflect, reminisce on some of the beautiful aspects of this thing called Christmas, particularly in light of the love of God. Now, this love of God is an interesting thing. It is so broad, so high, so deep, you'll never get around it as the song says. But I would like just to chip away a little bit today at one aspect of this. Now, as I read the New Testament, and I read about how we are meant to love God, love our neighbor, and love our enemies, I need to be honest with you, and I need to say I think we fall far short. If 1 Corinthians 13 is true, if 1 Corinthians 13 is true, then it says this, that every bit of religious behavior that you can have will mean nothing. It means nothing if it's not done out of the motive of love. Now, people, that's tough. That means you mean all the stuff that we do, the buildings that we build, the good works that we do, and all the, the nice things that we do for people around us, you mean they're going to mean nothing if we don't do them because of love? Exactly right. Now, I didn't say that. God said that. And so our motive is so important as to why we do the things that we do. Let me just read to you. I'm sure you can quote this parrot fashion. But just the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13 and see the magnitude of what this love and our response to God should look like. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, hey man, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, and have not love, I gain nothing. Then at the end it says this, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is, is love. Let's talk about this for a moment. You see, we have a problem here. I think I have the answer to the problem, so listen carefully. I think for many of us that this love thing is purely an academic assent to some religious fact. If I asked you today, how, how do you know that, that God loves you? How do you know that Jesus loves you? And many of you will quote the little song that we used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. And it's like this knowing is an academic assent. Knowing something is something that happens up here. And I have nothing against knowing those things. We go to Bible studies and that's really good where we study the Bible, but, but I think we kind of fall short, not so much in Bible study, but in Bible doing, because we know a whole bunch of stuff, but I don't see a lot of stuff actually happening. Something's breaking down where this should be. You see, the problem, I think, is what we call an 18-inch problem. I think the problem on the issue of love is it sits up here. We know a lot about it. We have stalked Jesus, and we have watched him. And we watch how he behaves, and we know how he will respond to different situations. We know it. We've preached thousands of sermons about it. We know it. But has it moved the 18 inches from here to here in the issue of do we really feel it? Do we really feel it? Now, I want to share with you some thoughts, and they may be sounding somewhat subjective because they're just my contemplations. They're just my ramblings. They're just my reminiscing on this issue of love. Now, to help me in my journey this last week, I've read three books, and I would recommend these three books to you to do the same thing. They're not theological books at all. These are inspirational books because I think this is where we've lost it. We know a lot about love, but we're not inspired to do it until we read some of the stories of people who haven't just known it but have begun to do it. 
So if you want to go out there and buy yourself or buy your, your husband, your wife, your kid, whatever, a book, here's three of them. The first one is a book called Love Does by Bob Goff. It's a great story of how he took the things that he knew and put them into life. They are just illustrations. They're not theological books. These are just inspirational readings. The second one is another book by Bob Goff called Everybody Always, meaning love everybody always and all of the time. Some great <laughs> inspirational stories of how he took what he knew and turned it into something that he did. The other one is a bit of a classic, and I know many of our teenagers have read this. It's called Crazy Love by Francis Chan. How Francis Chan had this very successful, in inverted commas, ministry, big church, and he just felt that this is not giving me the opportunity to get the rubber on the road and meet with the people. And so he moved out of that big church, and this is a story. With, it's called Crazy Love, because sometimes love can look a little bit crazy. And so I would recommend that in our in our sort of subjective look at this heart thing about what love should do in us, that you buy those three books. That might be quite useful to you. You see, Francis Chan suggests this. Believing in God is one thing, and it's politically correct. You can believe in God, and God knows going to do anything. It's politically correct to believe in God, and everybody will say, oh, that's okay. Your belief is what you choose is up to you. Believing in God has never really been a problem. But loving God will generally get you into a bit of trouble sometimes. Loving God is that stretch out of what you believe into what you need to do. And that's a different story. The world has never understood people who really, really love God. They're happy that you believe it, but they question things when you begin to love God. Now, Jesus' teachings are full of this all-or-nothing thing. I'm always scared of all-or-nothing because I know my personality is a bit of an all-or-nothing thing sometimes. And this all or nothing thing to say, unless you have this, nothing else counts, is very biblical. Jesus spoke often about it, some of the parables that he told. I love the one particularly of the, the guy who found the, the treasure in the field. It was an all or nothing deal. He went home and he said, sold everything that he had because he was obsessed with the treasure in the field. You see, love in the words of Francis Chan, and I didn't like this when I first read it, is an obsession. It's an obsession. There is nothing more that is on your mind. There is nothing more important. You dream about it. You think about it. You eat about it. You exercise about it. You are obsessed with this thing called love. Can you imagine church if each one of us became obsessed with a thing called love? Now, we find obsession easy. We can find obsession in anything out there. You know, But if we as a church, we're obsessed with loving God, loving others, and pray tell even loving our enemies, can you imagine what that would do for our church, for you, and for this as a community? There are three types of love. Let me share this with you. We've spoken about our response to God being love. Three types of love. The first type of love, as I read, is the commanded form of love where God says, thou shalt love me with thy whole heart, with all thy soul and mind and strength, everything. You will love me. And I thought about it, and I've often wondered, can, can, you, can you command me to love you? I don't think you can, because love is a free choice. I have to choose to love you. And here we have God commanding us to love him. And I've often wondered why, but I think I found it. I think I realized that God commanding us to love him is for our own good. God loves us so much that He will say, I love you so much, I don't want you to mess up your life. I don't want you to horse it up. I don't want you to go wrong in your life. I don't want you to make bad choices. Please, will you just love me? And if you love me, then you won't do all those other stupid things. It's kind of like a two-year-old kid that you have in your house, and he's calling around, and he comes up to a plug, and he takes his finger. He's just about to put his, his finger in the plug. Are you going to sit back and watch him do that? You love that kid. You're going to start issuing a few commands. You're going to say to the kid, hey, stop, 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 don't do that. Come back, come back, move back from there. Stop right where you are, turn around. You, that wouldn't sound very kind because you're commanding your kid. Why are you commanding your kid to obey you? Because you love that kid. And you don't want that kid to be hurt. I think it's the same with God. God commands us to love him because he knows it's good for us. 
And we are the obsession of God. He loves us that much. And so I don't have a problem anymore thinking that God commands me to love Him. The second kind of love is I've taken a reference from Ephesians chapter 2 here, is the first love. We have the story there of the angel coming down in Revelation chapter 2, sorry, and he's addressing the seven churches of Asia Minor. He's got a different story to tell. The first church is the church in Ephesus. Now the church in Ephesus to us would have looked like a great church. No heresy. They were doing good things. They were caring for the poor. The church stuff was happening. And then the angel says, but God isn't happy with you. You see, it's the 1 Corinthians 13 thing all around. Though you speak with the tongue of men and of angels, they haven't loved. Though you give your body to be burned. Though you give away all your things to the poor. Exactly what they were doing. And the angel says, God's not impressed because you have missed the point. And God says, return now to your first love. That's that passionate love. That's that obsessive kind of love. That's that all-consuming kind of love. God will never be satisfied with any other kind of love. He calls them lukewarm. Lukewarm. He says, I'd rather spit you out of my mouth. I'd rather you hot or cold, otherwise I'm just going to puke you out. That's tough words. And yet on the outside, they looked like they were doing the job. But the reason they were doing it was for all the wrong reasons. Lukewarm people. Yeah, if you want to know what a lukewarm person looks like, here's a couple of things. A lukewarm person doesn't really want to be saved from sin. He wants to be saved from the consequence of sin. I've got to tell you, people, I sit in an office, and I talk to people a lot of times during the day, and with great kindness, I say, I, I see people who come in, and their disaster has hit their lives. They're in a real place of trouble, and they think that if I become a Christian, then the God will sort out my, my problems. And they are the easiest people in the world to lead to Jesus because they think that Jesus is the answer to my personal problems. When they lead, lead to Christ and they pray the supposed sinner's prayer and they supposedly come to Jesus, by the time their problem has finished, they're out of here. They're not following Jesus anymore. They're not sorry for their sin. They don't care about sin. They just care about the consequence and the disaster that follows after sinful behavior. And so I see this all the time. Lukewarm Christians are just like that. Lukewarm Christians, secondly, gauge their morality or their goodness, personal goodness, by comparing themselves to others they consider worse than them. <laughs> There's always somebody worse than you. So if you want to escape this thing, just find that person and you will look a lot better. There's always somebody better than us and somebody worse than us. And people who are trying to find their way through their Christian faith and look better than they really are, find people that apparently look worse than them. But you might find the opposite to be true. Thirdly, lukewarm people are full of excuses. Jesus met a few of these guys. They all said the same thing. They all said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, that's a nice thing to say. I see a lot of people who do that today. And on one occasion in Luke 9, a man came and said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus kindly smiled. And he probably, he said this, he said, hey man, foxes have holes, the birds have their nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. Do you really want to do that? And the man didn't follow Jesus. Another man came and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus said to him, well, that'll be cool. The man said, well, God, for me, can I just go quickly and bury my father? They're full of excuses. Another man similarly said, I'll follow you, Jesus, but let me first of all go and say goodbye to my parents. And Jesus says this, that anybody who puts his hand to a plow and turns back is no longer worthy of me. Ah, a lot of lukewarmness out there. And then the third kind of love is what I've called a crazy kind of love. I've stolen that from Francis Chan. It's a crazy kind of love. In the name of loving Christ, some of the craziest things have been done. In the name of loving Christ, people have made sacrifices way beyond their means. In the name of following Christ, here's one thing. They love the person, the God, that they fear. That's interesting. We love the one that we fear. Now, we spoke two weeks ago about what it really meant to fear God, to walk in holy reverence with God, and to make God God not Mickey Mouse, not somebody we take out on a Sunday and put him back again. When we make a God, God, your first response will be on the floor. You will lie there. 
and you will realize who you are in the context of a holy God. And then we find on the other scale of things that if we love God, the one that we fear, you know what happens? Is we end up doing exactly the same things that we did because we fear God. We do the same things because we love Him, but we don't feel bad about it. There's no guilt involved. There's no shame involved because love has no guilt. Love has no shame. Love knows that my guilt is gone and that my shame has been dealt with and I just love God. But your Christian life, whether you do it legally or whether you do it through love, you will basically do the same thing. So you have a choice. Do we want to do it because we love Him or because we fear Him and we become a bunch of legalists? Crazy kind of love generally insists on personal sacrifice. In 1 Chronicles 21, we have David, and he had messed up, and he has to make a sacrifice to God to restore his relationship with God. So he finds a hill. He says, I need a hill on which to make my sacrifice. So he finds the owner of a hill. His name is Aruna. And he finds Aruna. He says, Aruna, I need to make a sacrifice. I want to buy the hill. Aruna recognizes him for years. David, you're the king. You, you, you don't need to pay me anything. I will give you the hill. And David emphatically says, I will pay for the hill. And then he says to Aruna, I want to build an altar. Aruna says to him, Lord, I've, David, I've got lots of stones. I can help you. I've even got builders. And David said, no, 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 no. This is my deal. And then I need an ox to put on my offering. And he said, but I've got lots of oxen. And by now, David is freaking out saying, Aruna, you don't seem to get it. I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. <laughs> I will not offer to God that which... And the arena says, David, you're crazy. Save your money. Go on holiday. Take your wife away. You know, save your money. It's crazy. I'm offering it all to free. Crazy love can very often be perceived to be something out of the ordinary. The woman we spoke about the other day who came into Jesus' presence with that oil, the disciples still back and said, what a crazy woman. <laughs> that stuff's over. We could have sold that and given it to the poor. Meanwhile, they wouldn't have. But, but you know... It's crazy that what this woman is doing. Those martyrs of days gone by who threw themselves to the lions, allowed themselves to be crucified on crosses and dipped in oil and burnt at the stake. And they willingly did it. People would say, you people are crazy, man. You see, that's what love for God can do. It can turn us crazy. Let's move to the last part. I want to talk quickly about loving others. And I'll sneak our enemies into this category as well. Here's a few things. I know Phil's going to put them on the screen up there. So if you want to know what it is, then you can write it down and think about it. The first thing that we need to know about loving others is that you'll know you have it. And it is defined as the love of God because God's loved you. You're giving away His love. And He's saying you'll know you have this kind of love when it's natural to give it away. You see, if we have to contemplate whether I should love somebody, you don't have it. But when you love that person, you know, just spontaneously with love, when you hear about a need and you do it straight away, that's love working through you and flowing through you. And you're saying, but what happens if I run out of love? What happens if I have to love everybody all the time and, and always and to each extreme? Will I ever run out of love? Can, do I have to stockpile a Is there a reservoir? in my head that I have to fill with this thing called love. Not at all. Love is not a reservoir, people. Love is a river, and it flows, and it goes past, and no more. But the more you love others, the more the river of life. I love that thought. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Remember that song? Makes the lame to walk and the blind. It's a great song. It's about a river of love and a river of life. And once it's gone, it's gone. You've got to wait for the next batch to come down. And God says, you will never out-love me. I talk to people who say, oh, I'm burnt out. I'm burnt out. And I believe in burnout. But I have a suspicion that burnout happens because we do what we do out of the wrong motive. If you do what you do as a Christian and do it because you fear people and what people are going to say about you and you fear the consequences of living the Christian life, you'll burn out in a month. You're not going to last that. But if you live and love God, you will never burn out if love is the problem. You can't burn out because God is love. He is the never-ending ocean of love, and you can draw any time from Him 
in order to be this river of life flowing out from you. You cannot burn out if your motive is love. If it's fear, you're dead in the water. And so we love others. We all know it's a spontaneous kind of a thing. The second thing under this section means love protects me from missing the point of my life. You see, God wants to protect you. That's why he says you must love him. True love for God will protect you from missing the point of your life. And you don't want to get to the end of the day and stand before God. And God said, man, you were quite impressive. You did all the stuff, you did, but you missed the point. How tragic would that be? But when you love God, then the point becomes so much more obvious and, in fact, attainable. That rich young ruler that we often mention, got some great things about him. That rich young ruler came to Jesus wanting a plan as to how he could inherit eternal life. He said to Jesus, Jesus, have you got a plan for me that I could get, you, get to heaven one day? And Jesus said, no, I don't have a plan for you, but I have a purpose for you. He says, go to love God and love your neighbor, and you'll be fine. You'll find God's purpose. So the finding of this purpose in life is not found in a plan, but understanding God's desire that you would begin to love Him and love others the way that He wants you to. And then at the same time, in the story of that rich young ruler, he gives them some practical advice. It's not about the plan. It's about finding the purpose. And then he gives them the plan and says, go in love the way that you should. In order to do that, you may need to get rid of some other stuff. Go and sell all you have and come and follow me. Next one. Love never gives up. You do know that, hey? Love never gives up gives up. We sang about it just now. It's crazy. This book that I have in my hand over here is the perfect illustration of the fact that God never gives up on us. When Adam messed up in the garden, God didn't give up on Adam. When Abraham came along as God's plan, and Abraham didn't do all that well, he did okay some of the time, but when God found Abraham and Abraham had messed up, God didn't give up on Abraham, and he gave him a son called Isaac. Isaac was a bit of a nebulous character, apparently. He didn't achieve much, but God never gave up on him. He had a son called Jacob, and Jacob was a thief. Jacob was a swindler, and God never gave up on this thief and this swindler. And out of that thief and that swindler came Joseph, the great, you know, the one who was thrown in prison as a slave, who wore the coat of many colors. And he was... He was amazing, but he was stuck in prison. God never gave up on Joseph in prison. And all those years that Joseph was waiting in prison, and, and he's waiting, he's praying, God, deliver me. I've done nothing wrong. And, and God says, in my time, but God never gave up on Joseph. And then we have Moses coming along, and Moses said he was useless. He couldn't speak. He had such low self-esteem, and, and he was a wanted man because he had killed somebody in Egypt. God never gave up on Israel and he never gave up on Moses. And out of Moses, he led the children of Israel through the wilderness. He never gave up on the children of Israel. They grumbled. He never gave up. They miserable. They worshipped other idols. God never gave up on those people. Think he's going to give up on you? <laughs> I don't think so. He has a perfect track record of not giving up. One of the most beautiful characteristics of love for one another is this one. We love one another. We never give up on each other. Wives who are praying for unsaved husbands, never give up, baby. You keep going. Husbands who are praying for unbelieving wives, you know, just keep praying, keep loving. Parents whose kids may not be doing so well. And sometimes with love, you have to stand aside a little bit. Sometimes your love may have to be a little bit tough. Maybe there are things that you will have to do under the name of love, but one thing you will never do is you will never give up. You never give up, people. So glad. So glad God never gave up on us. That's why we have a Christmas scene. And behind the cradle, there's a cross, eh? Hey? That's what it's all about. The cradle is magnificent, but it's all on the purpose of the cross. God never gives up on us. He gave the message to the patriarchs 
to say, I have a plan. And that plan was being fulfilled. He gave that same message to the prophets. And the prophets came and they were misunderstood. And many of them were maligned. And the patriarchs were misunderstood as well. And then they, he brought Jesus. He said, if they're not going to listen to the patriarchs and the prophets, I will send Jesus, my only son, to give them the message that I have not given up on them at Christmas time. And so he sent Jesus to us with the same message. I will never give up on you. So I don't care, people, what you've done, where you've been, what you think is unforgivable to you. God's never going to give up on you. In fact, it leads to number four here. Love will do whatever it takes. If you're a parent with a kid who's in crisis, you will do whatever it takes to look after that child, will you not? You will do whatever it takes. I, I, I heard somebody say this a while back. He was illustrating this point. He said, you know, if I had to come to you as a church and say to you, maybe as a, as a couple of people, say, hey guys, we need to buy a new sound system for the church. It's going to cost us five, five, $500,000 rand. And, uh, and you say, woo, Trev, that's a lot of money. You know, it's going to take us five years to raise that. But if I come to you and say, hey man, your daughter is terminally ill and your daughter by Friday is going to die. You need to find 500,000 rand. You will what? You will prove heaven and earth to save your daughter because of the extreme intensity and the obsession that I love this child so much. I don't love the sound system that much. So if it takes five years to raise it, that's tough. But when it comes to my child and there's a miracle cure that is going to cost 500,000 rand, but you will sell whatever you can. You will do whatever you have to do because you are desperate. You are totally desperate to find the cure for that kid. Love will do whatever it takes. Number five, I love this one. Love is not afraid of differences. Love is not afraid of different, in inverted commas. Look at us. <laughs> I think we're kind of different, eh? <laughs> we're different races, different cultures, different genders, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic. We are seriously different. And Jesus puts us all together and he says, okay, people, you're different. Now go and love one another. He's always done that. He took his disciples. And Jesus chose his disciples with this in mind, I think. He chose Matthew, a tax collector. He was a sellout to the Jewish nation. The other disciples took one look at Matthew and said, Jesus, we don't like him. Jesus said, tough, you will love him. And then he even called Judah, traitor, that they didn't know about. And he was, the, he was like the treasurer. And only at the end did they say, Jesus, you knew that he was going to betray him. Why, why, you, well, why did you call him to be a disciple? Jesus, well, that's my choice. You just love him even though he may be a traitor. Different political parties. There's Peter, who's probably a good Republican. If he were American, he'd be a Republican. And then you've got Luke, who's probably, you know, probably a Democrat. And he puts them all in one place with one command. He says, love one another. He does the same thing to us. And love is never threatened by different. Let me just do one more. Your love will be reflected in what you spend your life on. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 10 uses that word incredibly. It says this, If you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then, here's the big then, then your light will shine in the darkness. And then verse 11, you'll be like a spring. There's that spring of water bringing life wherever it goes. If you spend, it even tells you how to spend your life. When you spend something, it means you've got a limited amount. And we spend our lives because our lives are limited. Love has no limit. So we can keep spending and never, you can keep withdrawing on love. But your life's not like that. Your life has a beginning and it has an end on this planet. Otherwise, it's further into the future, obviously. But how you spend this life, people, will determine how you spend the rest of eternity. Folk, for goodness sake, people, spend this life well. On behalf of the hungry, satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Man. 
When I think about the needs of the oppressed, you know what this love makes me? makes me angry. It makes me angry that there are people out there that would abuse children. That makes me really angry. I don't feel sad. I don't feel glad. I don't feel bad anymore. I feel really mad when I hear that stuff. John and I were watching a documentary yesterday on Syria and the abuse of young children being used as children of war and telling kids that if they drive this van full of dynamite into the army camp that they'll go straight to heaven. And you've got these fathers giving up their children to drive trucks full of dynamite into, into enemy camps. People, that makes me mad. I don't know about you. I'm past sad. I'm past feeling bad. I am really mad. And Isaiah says when you get mad, that's what the church, church takes on a, a, more, a more militant thing. Militant in the best use of the word where our madness creates us to love people with a far deeper passion than any other time. The role of the church is uh, critical right now um, because the world we know will know who we are when we live like this. In John chapter 13, Jesus said this. He said to his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples when you what? When you love one another. It's a distinctive trademark of the church to the world around us. And when we love the world like this, the world will then sit up and take notice. They're not going to take any notice of us with our little sermons and our songs, as great as we love to do those things. The world is not going to take any notice of us if we build big buildings, but we need big buildings to be able to do this. But the world's not going to take any notice about us there. The world will know that we are disciples, people. Listen, when we love one another. Is it, surely there must be someone else? Apparently not. When we love one another, the world will say, we know who you are. The people that they say, the disciples, Acts chapter 11, talks about the disciples being first known as Christians in Antioch. Antioch is up north of Israel, and as the gospel began to grow, all of a sudden all these new Christians came to Antioch. And we read in Acts 11 that the people were astounded. They said, hey, we've heard about people like you. We've heard about people who love sacrificially. We've heard about people who love God passionately. we heard about people who don't love their lives, who love to serve God. We've heard about people like you, and we're going to call you Christians which means a little Christ. It's the only time that word is ever used in the Bible was in Antioch because they saw the difference that these people had in their lives. And they said, we know who you are. We've heard about you. Wouldn't it be cool if next year, when all the Christmas is said and done, that the work begins to make us something that the world will take note of who we are. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your incredible gift to us. Help us as we contemplate our returned gift to you. We pray, Lord, that we would understand what real love is all about. It's not just a head thing, an academic ascent to a whole lot of facts about you left heaven, you came to the cradle, you died on the cross. We believe those things in our heads. But, Lord, maybe we need to move those things into our hearts to feel a deep, obsessive passion toward you for who you are and for what you have done for us. That it becomes all-consuming. We can't think about anything outside of the context of our love for God. Our relationships with people, our relationships in our family, our relationships at work, our relationships in the community, at school, at university, our relationships in our marriage. If we were obsessed with Christ, what a different life we would live. I pray we grow in this obsession with Jesus to love you with a deep, heartfelt passion. And then, Lord, we do just close by saying thank you for your love for us. Never ending. It's an ocean of it. We can never run out of it. We thank you for it this Christmas time. We pray it in your name. Amen.